real life. Uh, hello, just in case you're watching this recording, um, this is a retrospective uh, for um, uh, recent uh, Jenkins uh, LTS releases. Uh, you may have seen uh, that uh, between uh, Jenkins 2.2, 2.3, uh, and 2.5, we had uh, a number of regressions. And after that, we had a discussion in the developer mailing list and agreed that we want uh, to review our processes and to discuss what went uh, uh, wrong and see how we could improve um, and how we uh, could improve quality of the next releases. If you're interested, you can find uh, these conversations some ways in the Jenkins developer mailing list. It's here. You can find uh, all the links uh, from there. Here's our Google Doc, and I guess uh, the main objective today is to discuss uh, this particular section. Uh, is it correct? So, uh, Oliver, uh, Rick, Daniel, is the, what is your agenda today? Or do we need to discuss anything else? Yeah, I guess the retrospective is all we got to discuss. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so. Yeah, we do retrospectives uh, uh, quite uh, differently, but yeah, since it's open source, and I think I think we could just discuss the feedback we received, and if any feedback is missing, let's just put uh, it to the bottom so that we can uh, reach uh, it uh, during the meeting. Okay. So the first item we got um, improve weekly releases quality so that regressions uh, don't uh, get fixed in LTS in the last minute. So it comes uh, from uh, uh, the history because uh, the main regressions which led uh, to the instability were actually integrated uh, early in the weekly cycle, but we didn't notice them until very uh, late phases in the LTS design. So for example, uh, Yes. Uh, we noticed them as regressions and yeah. we sort of acknowledged them, we just didn't address them. Okay, yeah, fair point. So, yeah, uh, what, uh, let me rephrase. Uh, I mean, that uh, we didn't, yeah, basically, what you said, we didn't act on them. So, two regressions were basically introduced in version 2.205. And uh, whatever happened with the backporting process, uh, we didn't really work on them until uh, February. So it was quite late. And if we, we fixed them earlier, we wouldn't have had uh, this problem in general. And for that, yeah, I think that we should just um, double down on uh, weekly release quality. Uh, one of items which is definitely missing is Jenkins Core Triage Team. Because right now we don't have, do not do regular uh, triage of incoming G ratios, so all the things uh, get uh, noticed eventually, but nobody regularly looks uh, at the issues. So, I think that it would be one main follow up, and I have an action item to recover this team. Uh, but I'm not sure whether this team would be enough. Um, are there any other suggestions or comments? To me, it feels challenging to actually motivate these people to be allocated to this, right? Because everybody, um, let's face it, everybody's got an interesting, more interesting project to work on and we're all busy. So it's very hard to get somebody's share of time on this and getting people allocated solely on this. I mean, it's very challenging to keep the team motivated and doing their job in the long term, as, as I see it. I totally agree with you. Uh, so what I was thinking about that, that we could uh, have uh, just one contributor, but on a rotation basis. So um, historically, one year ago, we didn't have so many people contributing to Jenkins Core, but it changed. So we expanded the Jenkins Core team. Now we could probably agree with this uh, within this team that somebody just uh, monitors and common fishes for one week, then somebody else, and uh, this is how we could balance the load. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I was monitoring uh, all incoming fishes uh, during the time frame of JEP 200 and other big changes we had a couple of years ago. 
Uh, I don't think it takes too much time uh, to monitor them, but having one person uh, who takes a look, let's say, every day would be really helpful. And the next step would be uh, to actually follow up and to define an action plan, because initial response is one thing, but uh, we also need to plan a fix. Uh, but even initial response and maybe some highlighting uh, for LTS would be nice. So, for example, uh, what if we discovered this issue? Um, uh, how? Sh so, right now we put LTS candidate only when we have a fix in general. What if we were doing it uh, in the very beginning of the process? or maybe using another label to highlight that uh, this issue might impact uh, previous LTSs, and it might be generally a big regression we want to fix. There are several currently open issues mm -hmm. that are labeled LTS candidate. Mm -hmm. so, do we need anything else, or are we just fine with regression or LTS candidate labels? So the expectation is that we would prioritize fix on the things that are labeled LTS candidate, correct? Yes. Uh, I mean, what would that accomplish? Uh, ideally, we want to fix all regressions. Well, it would be ideal state. Yeah, especially uh, in this case, um, the problem mm -hmm. is LTS candidate is for things that are expected to be backported. And the problems we encountered were reported ju in the weekly release just mm -hmm. after the last LTS baseline. So for yeah. its first three months, this would not be a backporting consideration at all because there were like 18 weekly releases during which a fix would be integrated mm -hmm. into the weekly and would go into the next LTS baseline like that. So mm -hmm. that is not really helpful. I think we should look more at the regression label because there aren't many of them. I have a Jira dashboard that shows like five regressions and 10 really popular bugs based on voters and watchers. And it's super trivial to look at that once a week. Mm -hmm. So basically you say that the current labeling is fine and we just need to look at uh, dashboard, maybe take priorities into account and that's it, right? Essentially, yeah. Uh, I mean, I can share my dashboard or a new dashboard with the same filters with you. Um, it's it's really not a lot of issues that are candidates for increased attention. Now, ideally, we want to fix bugs in general, but there's a difference between a bug where the only people, who, person who cares is the reporter and the bug that has like 15 watches and 10 votes. Mm -hmm. um, and there aren't all that many of those. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so it would definitely help. And yeah, we have obvious issue with who would fix uh, the defects. Uh, but yeah, maybe you said expand the Jenkins core team, uh, you'll uh, have a better situation there now. At least uh, in the case of these issues, when I highlighted them, uh, JC fixed uh, this one almost immediately. Uh, this one, uh, yeah, I guess it was basically uh, fixed by Dependa bot, but uh, we also did some analysis and testing weekly and uh, it happened only when uh, these issues were highlighted um, in the discussions. So if you highlight them earlier, maybe it will be enough. Okay. Anything else about that or should we move uh, to the LCS process part? I guess it uh, would be the most important thing in this discussion. Is there an action item to create uh, uh, the dashboard for the core team or whoever has free hands to help? Um, I can take that. Okay. Um, let's do that. 
Uh, so it's basically to publish PDFs, but you already have it. Uh, I have some more stuff in mind. I will just create a, a dedicated one. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I also have some queries uh, I used to run on a regular uh, basis before. Um, so we can uh, expand this information. And right now we have um, a documentation in progress in the Jenkins repository. So we could uh, just uh, dump all the links then. So there is a pull request for maintainer guide. So you need to go to the second page to discover pull requests, uh, which are two weeks long. So, yeah. yeah. So I think we can just uh, put this information in the maintainer guide without spending too much time on additional documentation right now. And then we can expand it incrementally. Um, Okay, yeah, thanks Oliver. I put action items there. Yeah, maybe I will even embed the dashboard uh, on the wiki page. It's possible with Markdown, it's possible with a ski doc. Oh, I'm not sure how GitHub would render that. But yeah, I'll uh, do some experiments. Okay. So the next item is about uh, discovering issues. Uh, so one of the reasons uh, why we had these issues is was backporting. Uh, it was related uh, to backporting of 5738. So it was a relatively minor regression. Well, I don't consider it minor, but it was reported long ago and we didn't have so many votes. Uh, but we backported it, and uh, in parallel with that, uh, we also backported uh, the entire Winston upgrade. So there was a comment uh, that, uh, yeah, I will mark it as LCS candidate, but if you apply Winston backporting uh, due to whatever regression in 5.6. Uh, so basically, instead of custom uh, Winston version, uh, the entire Winston was backported. And again, uh, there is no blame at all because uh, there were multiple reviewers who were supposed to, to take a look and they, everyone missed that. So it's something we just need to review. And here, so what would help to discover such comments uh, and uh, to act on them? Yeah, it was absolutely a misunderstanding on my side when I reread it after you pointed me to that. It was absolutely clear what you find out. Uh, I misunderstood mm -hmm. that at 5.6 is sufficient, and I guess that was exactly what was reported, and we haven't bumped as mm -hmm. far as we uh, as we needed to. So yeah, there's a misunderstanding on my side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, it's a bit challenging. I do the due diligence to actually reading all the comments and then uh, screening all the jiras mm -hmm. before something gets reported, but obviously this, uh, this slipped in. So I'm definitely open to, um, to discussion what to do to make this uh, mm -hmm. uh, easier to spot and harder to miss. Yeah, so my suggestion would, was to just, uh, <laughs> just put another label. Uh, well, it's a quick win solution. Definitely uh, your proposals about pull uh, requests is also something we need uh, to discuss because it could help uh, to get more reviews. But uh, what if uh, we just uh, added labels there? Or maybe added, uh, would it help you, Oliver? Or would it be also a problem? Yeah, I mean, it, it would definitely serve the purpose that extra care needs to be taken. But the thing is that there is still the human element that as we know can fail us, right? So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I'm wondering how to do that. Um, I'm trying to look at it from, from a different perspective because in the vast majority of the cases, um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm backporting fixes I haven't altered. And a lot of the fixes I backport is actually made by the folks that does the reviewing and probably would be interested in do the reviewing of the backports. So mm -hmm. how about getting the, the owner or the assignee of the issue that is being reported to actually have it reviewed? 
I mean, I understand it, you know, puts the burden on the other people that they're supposed to review the backboard. But since they understand it the best and they understand of all the implications and things that might be very hard to share in plain English. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. It would be definitely important. So, and uh, in, in this case, it's definitely a mistake on my side. Uh, because I was uh, the one uh, who submitted a pull request to, to bump uh, the dependency. I was uh, the one who uh, marked as LCS candidate. And I received notification uh, when it uh, was backported. Uh, and yeah, basically, I was busy with other stuff, so I didn't really review that. So we, if we could ensure that uh, um, uh, there is additional uh, review notice and that we ensure that uh, contributors really review that. It would be nice. I was thinking that uh, the best way for that uh, is just uh, do it through pull requests. And, and I guess your comments here are basically the same. So have uh, reporting through pull requests. Though the question is how to do that. I guess uh, um, your preference is to have one bulk pull request which does initial backporting and uh, then a number of minor ones if we need to fix something. Yeah, my proposal really was that we would as a community to cultivate the content of a single pull request and then when we are all uh, okay with, with what's in there, we would just merge it as it is. So basically the work in progress would be I mean, isolated in the single pull request. So that's what, mm -hmm. what we're working on right now. And at the time you merge it, which actually represents the agreement that this is what goes into the next release. Obviously, mm -hmm. if we forget something or discover something later, we would just create a follow up mm -hmm. if we absolutely need to. But the proposal for uh, my proposal was that it would really be a single PR for a single LTS branch. But then was uh, Daniel with some, some corrections and good points. Mm -hmm. uh, so one PR introduces problem when we want to add or remove content. The previous review becomes outdated. Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> true, but at the same time, it's uh, better than the current state. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, well, the current state is mm -hmm. directly committing to the branch mm -hmm. after locally applied backports, right? Um, I, I think this is a false uh, comparison mm -hmm. because another option would be to actually have per issue, per feature PRs into LTS. Uh, next to the other ones, since we introduced the label uh, into LTS, which we can always rename, um, it would be easy enough to distinguish uh, LTS-related uh, backport pull requests from the others. I don't really see the benefit of having one uh, pull request for benefit, although Oliver makes a good point that it would allow us to identify to basically already have the LTS in a separate branch because this would probably be an origin L uh, PR anyway, based on an origin branch. Um, and so we have the actual final LTS branch and we deliver from one other branch into that. So I can see it going both ways. Mm -hmm. Another advantage of this approach is that basically it requires less time because if we start creating multiple parallel pull requests, then firstly you on the hook uh, to resolve potential merge conflicts if they happen. Then uh, whomever does the backporting uh, has to spend more time to submit the pull requests uh, separately. Uh, so uh, it includes some overhead. So I mean, I'm, I I think if we want to start with one pull request and and learn from how the reviews there work and such, um, that's fine with me. Mm. And I mean, depending on how Oliver has time or whoever would open that pull request, um, we basically we 
there's there's a fair likelihood that we have mm-hmm. most of the stuff in toward the beginning of the backport window, right? Um, which um, would allow someone interested in reviewing to submit a review even after it was merged, so we can always amend the branches needed. Yeah, I don't mind uh, being the one creating the creating the the branch both initially, so we test how does this really work, or even in the long term. I mean, I presume this all becomes uh, semi-automated, so even the pull request creation with some template and uh, you know mentioning necessary people and labeling or whatnot uh, can be done with with automation. So I don't expect that would be that that much of a problem, and I I'll definitely uh, agree to you know start doing this. Mm-hmm. Uh, I guess uh, uh, current core pull request reviewers will be fine uh, to dedicate some time uh, to reviewing LCS. And we can request reviews from whomever contributed fixes. So uh, I believe that uh, the most of uh, patches come from people uh, who are members of uh, Git- Jenkins GitHub organization. So everybody can just request reviews directly. Yeah, that's right. Perhaps a little bit of a challenge would be that we basically backport based on Jira, so where we have the Jira IDs. We have access to the commits inside, but actually identifying the, the particular GitHub uh, handles for uh, for the users, there will be some some mapping or some, some challenge to overcome. But... Yeah, so right now what we are doing, um, so if you go to the uh, Jenkins um, IO repository, um, there you can see that uh, for example, for weekly YAML, uh, we updated our tooling uh, to include, uh, uh, it should be in the bottom. So our tooling uh, includes authors of uh, uh, pull requests right now. We just don't expose it in the change log, but uh, we can use this metadata, for example, in backporting tool or anywhere else to generate a list of uh, review requests. Mm-hmm. If okay. it helps, or you can just take a look manually because yeah, this information is injected uh, into all recent releases, um, right. and uh, we will be doing uh, we will be improving uh, visibility of contributors later. So yeah, even if this should be a manual step for now or manually look up mm-hmm. of the of the username that don't traditionally contribute, I mean I, I still agree that it would be a uh, help to the process. Mm-hmm. Okay, so if we could start from there and then, uh, well, basically, Oliver, uh, depending on your our preference and on initial feedback, we could switch to this approach. It definitely includes more overhead, but uh, if you feel confident about that, we could try it out. But yeah, just starting from here would be a great step for me. Mm, I would have thought the, the second one's probably lower overhead for reviewers, um, as you're just reviewing quite a small change normally, um, and then it, go, it gets merged as soon as it's ready. But it's more possibly overhead opening all the pull requests. It depends on how much there is to be backported. Mm-hmm. But yeah, right. Mm. Well, it's mostly overhead uh, for those who is doing backports because yeah. uh, you have to prepare all branches. You have to submit these pull requests. Yes, technically we could automate that, but automating that uh, would also require some time. Uh, well, 90% of times it will likely work, but still uh, uh, it's complicated, but yeah, you could try it. Uh, I'm just not sure about now. Yeah, and one note that uh, so Tim, you said that you don't want it to block. Uh, so basically, a fast integration, right? So you don't uh, want to go through twenty-four hours timeout, or do we want to apply to the apply the for LTA? Yes. I wouldn't have thought there'd be a rush unless it's needs expediting. So 
Why, why would there be a rush? If it's if this is the large PR for the LTS, isn't it? Yeah. I don't, well, for the large PR, I don't think there would be any rush, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyway, it's a detail. And uh, I can just put it here that the LTS base lines uh, don't apply uh, to the documentation we have, and that's it. Mm -hmm. um, are there any objections giving it a try with the dot two release? Which would be started backporting next Wednesday this time. Sorry, uh, next Thursday, I guess. Sounds fun. Mm -hmm. mm, I'm fine as well. Okay, so I'll take that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, I think we can just start from there. Okay, and yeah, the next time. Probably we could uh, go back because yeah, we switched uh, to pull request reviews. Uh, do we need uh, to do additional uh, markers uh, or whatever? If yes, even that uh, additional contributors uh, contribute to pull request reviews. Or do we just uh, rely on this process and don't do anything with Jira for now? Oh, sorry, like I'm not sure I'm following you. You mean if if we change this on a GitHub side, if it would, the change would somehow propagate to, to Jira? No, do we need any changes on Jira in parallel with what we do with GitHub? <clears throat> well, I don't think so. I guess at the time we merge the pull request, somebody would have to go and change the labels from candidate to, to fixed in particular mm -hmm. version, which I guess would be where I integrate that. Again, since I'm the LTS lead, I'm fine doing that. I've been doing this before. So it just okay. slightly changes the time uh, when this is being done. Um, but yeah, I, actually you got me thinking that perhaps it would be good to somehow indicate in the Jira that this, is, that this has been put into the pull request, right? So owners and uh, original contributor, and I don't know, people mm -hmm. that are watching for that would be aware that we are considering that and can be part of that mm -hmm. discussion because it would be detached. So yeah, that's a good mm -hmm. point. Yeah, reference uh, reporting uh, pull requests from issues. Strictly speaking, that's already the um, version number dash fixed label, right? Mm -hmm. Because if there's a single pull request collecting all the back ports, there's no question that this will be merged. And at that point, it's just sort of a sore, soft, reviewable. Uh, LTS branch itself. But I think the question of this section, Oliver, is more about uh, do we need special indication, for example, if we can already tell in advance that if you backport the specific thing that is the LTS candidate, you will also need to pull in something else. Um, like uh, the suggestion here that Oleg had marked the non-trivial backporting, um, or uh, recently I remember um, I nominated uh, Tim's read-only job configuration page change as an LTS candidate, and there are linked issues that would also need backporting if that were accepted. Yeah, I, I wasn't referring to that. So yeah, uh, I think my, my suggestion to this was, I mean, probably not a very systemic one, but suggesting that there will be more eyes on the process. So these kind of issues is less likely to slip in. Uh, if we, I mean, I don't have a strong opinion on this. I sort of suspect that even if we add this label, it doesn't necessarily make sure that whoever does the backporting doesn't miss an important piece of information somewhere in there, right? So I guess mm -hmm. this would be very, very structured, like if backporting A, B needs to be backported as B, perhaps we can somehow encode that, right? I don't know, either in labels or, or links or whatever, 
and mm. then we can actually have an automation that would uh, keep us accountable right i mean uh, when i send the announcement there is an uh, there is a automation to actually verify that the rc bits are deployed before i send an email and there is no way that email would go out if the bits are not already there and i guess we can do something like that to actually make sure that if we say well okay if a b needs to be backported as well so we can actually you know get some other automation around that it would actually verify that these kind of preconditions are all met that's something i can imagine but if we essentially say that this is non-trivial and care needs to be taken we again are back in relying that humans would do the right thing yeah right but at least we highlight that it's not uh, trivial so that uh, maybe we can go through comments and we can highlight that uh, these issues require additional uh, reviews before the posting so yeah i mean uh, no yeah. objections from me okay i'll probably we, just we, uh, edit then and, uh, yeah, even if it's not consistent uh, when somebody sees that we can at least refer to the discussion or maybe uh, uh, make sure that uh, whomever was involved uh, review final pull request mm -hmm. so um quick question is there any situation in which backporting would be considered non-trivial that is not um, related to other issues in JIRA, meaning um, could we not just link issues and require that linked issues surface well, in backporting? Yeah, imagine uh, we didn't have uh, all these issues with Winston, but we just uh, had uh, this issue, which still uh, requires a uh, four-version bump of Winston. I would say that even if there was no report issues with Winston, uh, it uh, would have been an untrivial backporting because yeah, there are four, four releases uh, jump, which includes uh, something like eight or nine objective releases. So even without reported issues, uh, it would require additional uh, care when doing such a backport. But, but if you look at the original issue rather than what we discovered late and what went wrong in 2204.3, mm -hmm. um, it introduced a regression uh, in through use of Winstone 5.8 instead of mm -hmm. 5.9 or 5.6 instead of 5.7. Yeah. Um, Yes, this one. Um, and that could easily have been a linked issue in JIRA that basically says this issue caused the other one. And uh, it could I mean, I mean uh, I'm, I'm not saying that the label is wrong, but it yeah. seems like we introduce a less uh, useful um, alternative to linking issues specifically for this purpose. Now, maybe this is what we have to make it super visible, but uh, Oliver, I don't know what the state of your backporting automation is or whether you do everything manually, um, but I would say as soon as there's a linked issue, uh, if you have a script or something that would be uh, surfaced and uh, would need separate acknowledgement perhaps. Right. Um, currently, when it comes to links, linked issues, we rely basically on, on the fact that they will spot this. Partially because not all the causes or, I mean, all the link types seems to have a different semantics to what we're discussing, right? None of them explicitly says if A is backported, B needs to be backported as well. Um, so I like this proposal, um, but I would probably vote for having a different link type so it can be, you know, even meshing processable that, uh, mm. that this only relies to backporting because otherwise, yes, we can obviously improve. I mean, I, I have this um, thing that lists all the, all the important details for the candidates and what is backporting and what's not, how old is it and stuff like that. And perhaps uh, it, it definitely can be extended in a way that it says, okay, but if we backport this, there are these other uh, issues that was caused by that and that needs to be exported as well. But basically that would require a manual, again, manual review of these issues to see because they can be in a, I don't know, they not everything that is linked with the causes link type does necessarily needs to be backported in my opinion right but you will need a manual review anyway even if you have the non-trivial backporting label right the non-trivial backporting label tells you hey something's going on here 
you need to be very careful when backporting this. While the causes relationship says, hey, you need to be careful when backporting this. Look at this other issue to figure out what's going on. So the second has a higher fidelity. Um, the only difference is you you cannot do a nice search with the second one. You can get the first one in a filter. Uh, yeah, I misspoke. I understand. I, I agree that that this proposal is one step better than the non-trivial backporting label. Agreed. Mm -hmm. So to clarify, I'm not saying we shouldn't do non-trivial backporting I, um, as an additional indicator that might might still be useful. Uh, what I'm saying is that any tooling or process we apply during the backporting process should look not just for the label, but also at linked issues. Now, obviously the semantics are sometimes not great, but even if you have a backport candidate that has a linked issue, probably means you should take a look at that link relationship and the linked issue, um, even if it's not the cause relationship uh, mm -hmm. specifically. Uh, and if it turns out to not be a big deal and uh, irrelevant for backporting, then we've spent 20 seconds really well uh, ensuring that there's nothing nothing going on here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree that this would be an improvement. Okay, so I know that uh, it is ensure that uh, issue links are created for cost regulations during the issue triage. Is it uh, what you said, Daniel? Well, the details are part about issue uh, link types. Sorry, what was the question? Uh, so, yeah, I just added uh, an action. Uh, so, is it uh, what uh, you said? Uh, just create links so that somebody takes a look at them. Right, there are two parts to this. Ideally, we uh, look at, uh, when, when we investigate issues, we create the causal relationships. That's the uh, one half of it. The other half is that uh, Oliver who, or whoever else is uh, doing the backporting uh, considers these link relationships um, as important data, uh, as potentially important metadata uh, to inform how how things should be backported or whether things should be backported, because. If an LTS candidate is uh, marked to cause an unresolved issue, that's probably going to be a rejection right there. Mm. Okay, so something like that. Uh, consider labels. Okay. Those are good points, Daniel. Okay. relationships and non-trivial LTS backporting label. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So yeah, I'll see whether we could mark uh, some more issues for non-trivial LTS backporting. We definitely had one historically, for example, all the uh, remoting backports and other things. Uh, so maybe we have some. Uh, for the next uh, LTS, but I doubt. Actually, it's good if you have uh, no such issues, <laughs> but let's see. Okay, should we move on? Mm, we have something like 15 minutes left. 
and sure we get uh, more users involved in uh, Jenkins LTS release candidate reviews and testing. So I believe reviews is more or less addressed with pull requests and with other topics, but testing is still a problem because uh, all the issues we had, uh, they could have been discovered by RC testing and it definitely didn't happen. So we, I was thinking that if we could somehow improve visibility of uh, release candidates, we could uh, get more users uh, testing them and providing feedback. Does it sound possible or is it just wishful thinking? I mean, it can hurt to expose release candidates more publicly mm -hmm. and not just rely on the limited audience of the dev list mm -hmm. Um, to get testing in um, the problem specifically with the with the issues we experienced here is they are for very specific setups and basically impossible to catch in uh, what I would call test testing setups. Uh, one was extremely long configuration forms, typically the co cloud configuration, even if you have a cloud configuration with five different cloud templates configured, uh, you won't hit this. You need dozens, many, many dozens. You need to click really many buttons to trigger this issue. And the other issues were um, the wildcard certificates, also probably not something that your test environment has, and a very narrow and not recommended reverse proxy configuration. So maybe I'm underestimating the fidelity of uh, or complexity of test environments, but it's every test environment. Environments. Like most production environments wouldn't catch it. Like yeah. 90, 90, high 90% 90 of production environments wouldn't catch it. It's, it's, not, it's not even a test environment problem, I don't think. It's just edge cases and configuration that can be used. Well, specifically in the reverse proxy um, host header case, right? If mm -hmm. you configure the host headers in one order, it's broken. In the other order, it's fine. Um, that was, was an annoying one. So, and I mean, in the totality of all Jetty users, that still occurred plenty but um, I'm not sure how that would help here. So uh, obviously the plan, but the idea is good and recommendable and we should be doing it, but we shouldn't expect miracles. That's, that's what I'm trying to say here. Yeah, I agree. So we had some uh, regressions in previous versions. Yeah, not this one, but yeah, I guess uh, some other regressions uh, would be more feasible. Uh, yeah, who knows? Maybe with configuration as code, etc., there will be no real difference between test and production environments uh, in uh, many companies. But let's see. Yeah, I want to see you submit a form greater than 200K with uh, config as code installed. That's no way. But yeah. Still uh well, but because perhaps... code would mean that <laughs> wouldn't catch it either because we don't we don't go in that way. Exactly. Uh but yeah, still in general it would be nice to promote it a bit, uh maybe just for visibility. So what yeah, I was thinking on the of... download page, maybe. Yeah download page uh, also I was thinking just about tech with github release because right now if you are subscribed to Jenkins CI Jenkins then you get notification and there is a number uh, 914 so this is a number of uh, github users who are guaranteed to receive notification and actually uh, this number doesn't include uh, ones who just watches releases so I'm not sure what is the exact number, but if we just push it, uh, let's say through GitHub releases, uh, additional notifications uh, would uh, go out. Yeah, uh, good idea. And yeah, Twitter or whatever, well, it's quite straightforward. Somebody just needs to tweet this stuff. But, uh, but when it comes to comes to this, that we require that we publish this release at the time that we have started the backporting, right? 
So it'd be, it really would be putting there the, the release candidate as a release. Mm. You'd have it as a pre, so there's a pre-release button in GitHub. So you take the pre-release flag and mark it as an RC. Yeah. Then it like gives a very clearly warning. This is a beta or pre-release. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the question again? Whether we wait for the release candidate or go earlier? I didn't understand the question. No, the Olex suggestion was that we would publish a GitHub release in order to get all the people that are subscribed to notifications. So we inform them that there is a release candidate for them to test. And my concern was that we would have to, you know, basically just create these releases for the RC. I was afraid that he was suggesting using something like draft releases, which obviously doesn't send notifications, etc. So yeah, I guess with this, what is it, alpha releases or whatever they call it, pre-releases, this would not be an issue. And you just click the button right there and that's it. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So basically, we merge the pull request that we've reviewed and approved, um, and you deploy the release candidate, uh, send out emails, we create the release in GitHub, we probably tweet about it. Um, sounds reasonable. Yeah. So it's just the best effort uh, to get highlights. Uh, what team proposed the link from downloads. It makes sense because we already have incremental releases. So we could just uh, add a line or whatever referencing release candidates and other things. But yeah, right now it's, so if somebody is willing to do that, it would be great. Right now we don't, so for example, here on past releases, so we could just put release candidates. Could we move on to the next item? I think that's an interesting one. Now, okay. Oh, yeah. So I guess we will stop here. I'm sure that Jenkins LTSRC backporting and testing timeframes don't have too much overlap. So I think it was one of the root causes. For example, for me personally, it was definitely a root cause. Uh, we had uh, an effort to get a lot of changes to towards uh, the LCS baseline, including uh, system read permissions, including managed permissions, plus some web UI things, uh, plus uh, backports and other things. And uh, although we historically uh, say that uh, the releases uh, are expected to be uh, several weeks old, so it should be yeah, here. The baseline release type is technically between two to five weeks. Uh, what we de facto uh, do now is uh, take uh, the most recent uh, release which seems to be stable. So if we had at least uh, four weeks gap, I would say, then uh, we wouldn't have overlap between uh, a new LTS baseline and the previous one, but right now everything was happening on the same week. Let me see if I understand understand mm -hmm. your concern. So yeah, I, I agree that we have sort of drifted off from this two to five mm -hmm. weeks because there was a lot of pressure, you know, obviously, I mean, the developers would like to have mm -hmm. the latest features in, in the LTS, which I understand. Um, so even you would benefit if we would be more conservative in choosing the, the baselines. Uh, to be honest, I don't understand how that would change anything, because okay. if you because the problem is we have the um, LTS cycle so that every four weeks we mm -hmm. work so that it is on a four week cycle and activities related to LTS repeat every four weeks. Mm -hmm. um, and it's worse for the point one because for LTS users, that's a major version increase. But the problem here was actually the point three pepper preparation rather the point than the point one preparation. So that exactly. doesn't apply here. So um, mm -hmm. if we just said, for example, um, and you said four weeks, if we just moved the LTS cut off to four weeks earlier, 
then you would have been busy with the LTS preparation or the baseline, getting your fixes into the upcoming baseline four weeks earlier and would not have had time to review and test LTS point two rather than LTS point three. So I don't see how that would help anything at all. It's not what I propose. Uh, so right now the situation is that so the critical part is here between week two and week four. So it's uh, LC testing. And uh, then uh, here's release and next LCS baseline selection. So if we say that we follow how uh, the documentation uh, on uh, our site, then uh, uh, the weekly merge window would be some way here. So during backporting or even before, but not during the testing side. Right now, so what we have, we have uh, a weekly merge rush between two and uh, week two and four, just getting uh, the last minute changes in place. And at the same time, yeah, we have uh, LTS release, but basically people do not uh, spend too much time on looking at that. So for me, okay. what, would, uh, what would be pre the preference? That week zero is um, LTS, uh, backporting and reviews, then uh, yeah, whatever weekly, and then we have time for testing. Could you line up the week numbers with the LTS schedule? Um, mm -hmm. Meaning the weeks uh, 0 through 24 on the linked uh, wiki page? Mm. Okay, sorry. So you uh, are talking about it, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're here. Mm, so this is dot three selection, and uh, this is uh, Z uh, chosen. So our main problem is that uh, Z chosen, but uh, Z merge window is somewhere between twenty two and twenty four now. So very uh, last weeks uh, for uh, dot three preparation. Instead of doing dot three preparation, uh, people are spending time on wiki. Right. So for me, this is the problem. And even if uh, so, if we strictly follow this part of the process, it wouldn't have been a problem because uh, weekly integration would be happening some way here, uh, which is uh, probably uh, collides with other things. But it's better than uh, last minute. Uh, 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 merges when uh, we have uh, dot three um, testing uh, and dot three is our last uh, LCS baseline, so we are going to move on after that. Okay, yeah, I, I see it because we have basically two weeks of activity and two weeks of inactivity in each LCS cycle. So if we did move it two weeks, we would go into the uh, inactive part of the LTS cycle. So, but re realistically, um, we have two options. We implement what's actually documented and require LTS baselines to be slightly older, uh, no exceptions, which means there cannot be a rush on the, or the rush would be uh, slightly earlier. Um, and we would then have also more confidence in the baseline, or we introduce an additional L delay between LTS baselines in the LTS calendar, so that, for example, uh, we activity from week 14 uh, on is moved back two weeks, so that basically the LTS point three is the LTS release that's valid for six weeks, rather than just four. Uh, or do you see further options here? Well, we could obviously just try dot four, so that uh, there is no pressure to integrate uh, all fixes in dot three, and uh, that if something goes wrong, it's not our last uh, LTS, the base process. But I think that uh, the first step would be to just uh, follow this two weeks advance as a, as a default. Obviously, we could uh, reconsider that if there is something critical. Uh, but yeah, if you just say that uh, two weeks uh, is our default uh, state, unless uh, so there is strong consensus in the community, it would uh, improve the situation. 
Um, could we? Do? So uh, when mm -hmm. I think back to yeah. over the past few years, how we, LTS baseline selections work, um, we basically looked at releases, and in many many times, uh, we basically said, "Well, I like the release from two weeks ago, but if mm -hmm. you look at the change log for the release one week ago." Um, we're just fixing bugs that we want to be LTS candidates anyway. So we can go one week more recent. And mm -hmm. at least I, I haven't checked, but that's how in my mind we got to the very aggressive releases. Now, obviously, 2.2.22 is an abomination of changes that... Mm -hmm would typically disqualify a baseline, but there was strong demand to choose it, uh, so we did. Um, so perhaps we can say, um, don't go newer than two weeks for uh, any releases that contain notable features. So if like the feature release is two weeks old, but the two weeks afterwards only did bug fixes, we can go with the newest release. But if there are features in there, we don't. Something along those lines. Um, maybe we don't have to uh, note it down and make it the strict law of the Jenkins project to do it like that. But I think that would be a reasonable rule of thumb to not go artificially far back and just increase the workload for LTS backporting into point one because we need to pick up all of the bug fixes. Mm -hmm. I'm usually the conservative voice when it comes to the discussion and uh, I, I sort of agree that there would be different reasons why to be more conservative when doing that and uh, I like the point that Daniel made that uh, no exceptions because of features but perhaps exceptions because of bug fixes but at the same time this is the most commonly heard reason for people nominating something newer than that right? Usually when people want us to choose aggressive uh, LTS baseline is because mm -hmm. of some features API or something. So we would have to tell no to a fair deal of developers. I'm just pointing it out. I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. Well, uh, there could be a potential alternative uh, if we really need uh, to deliver, for example, 2.22. Uh, In this case, I believe it was a good justification because features delivered there are really important. Uh, but for example, we could have said that uh, we understand it's important, uh, we agree to go with it, but uh, let's say we delay the LTS cycle by two weeks so that we have more time for integration, testing and feedback uh, before shipping it. So yeah, we intentionally shipped everything by two weeks so that uh, there is no collision with dot uh, three. Would it make sense or would it uh, create more confusion, especially for users? Well, it would probably be easier for whoever needs these new features in LTS because slipping by mm -hmm. two weeks is probably better than slipping by 20. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think, I mean, it's just another irregularity to the, um, around, the, around the timing of LTS. We've done that mm -hmm. once in a while, uh, usually for more serious reasons. Mm -hmm. I don't feel that strongly here. Uh, Kaske is not here to tell us that it's very important to not to disappoint people on, on their schedule. I don't consider that that's to be all that important that we release every every four weeks. I mean, ultimately, there's not a big difference between either approach. The difference is just where do we introduce the delay, right? Because both approaches of having a later point one in the schedule and choosing an older baseline mean that any features will be at least six weeks old as uh, LTS.1 is released. Um, it it, the difference is simply um, how old the release would be at the time that we decided. Another point there is, let's presume that this was the discussion, right? So we choose one. Uh, sorry, 2.222 as an LTS baseline when it was the latest release, and we would choose to actually postpone everything by two weeks. Would it not create a push on the core reviewers to actually be very conservative in the next uh, in the next weeklies? 
if might. So um, I think that it will be natural for us uh, to become more conservative when it comes uh, to the end of the merge window of uh, new LCS. But at the same time, uh, yeah, people will try to deliver changes and uh, yeah, we're interested to help them. So for me, I would rather accept uh, being more conservative after the LCS talk than before. Um, but it's complicated. So in this case, I'm confident that going with 2.2 .2 was important. And uh, if it required uh, some adjustments on my side uh, for weekly soft that I would be fine. Mm -hmm. I see. I mean, I don't, I mean, what Oleg is proposing that in case there will be a strong demand because of features to choose an aggressive baseline, postponing LTS schedule by two weeks is probably not a big deal for me. But Daniel, how do you feel about that? If that's a use case we want to support, I mean, uh, to clarify, do you mean as an exception? or as a general new process? As an exception and as a process, we should double down uh, on what is documented, I believe. Yeah, life happens. Sometimes features get delivered lately, but uh, we shouldn't set expectation that it's normal. Um, so for example, this release, we could have selected as an exception, uh, delete, uh, the next baseline, uh, invest more time in testing, spend time on those three. But it's not something uh, we should be doing every LTS baseline because uh, people will deliver last minute changes. I mean, I see essentially two options here. Um, one is we really try to enforce the minimum age rule again. Mm -hmm. um, that is documented and that we've sort of given up uh, recently. And when we do, um, we will have a better time also communicating that to contributors. Um, mm -hmm. Rather than, you know, recently we always went with the newest one, somehow gets transformed to, all right, this is the exact weekly cutoff for your feature to get in. Um, the this only makes sense if we're confident that there won't be a lot of pressure on uh, during the LTS baseline selection to go with the newest releases because one of the features was delayed or something. Um, the other option of, I mean, for me, it is still a possible option to have 14 week cycles with an extended RC period 4.1 or backporting period either works um, that would make it really easy because we basically do the LTS baseline decision earlier in that schedule we could also as an alternative uh, make the LTS baseline decision in general earlier so if you look at the LTS documentation uh, currently, we choose the LTS, uh, the next LTS baseline um, mm -hmm. on the release of the point preceding point three. Uh, if we decide two weeks earlier, um, no, that's four weeks, two weeks earlier, one mm -hmm. table cell. Um, so just uh, in, in week 10 or in week two, 22, when we publish the RC 4.3, um, that will also give uh, us more breathing room for the new release automatically mm -hmm. because the super late release just will not exist at this point and we cannot choose later. Obviously, uh, if we go this route and look at older LTS releases only, we s we are back at this this problem we had like five years ago, six years ago, when the LTS releases were really badly outdated. 
and even the current LTS line just felt wrong if you were working on master. Mm -hmm. So I think it makes sense for us to implement one measure, but not more. And now the question is, which is the um, most appropriate uh, one to do? Maybe it's a question for Oliver, because if we move uh, baseline selection two weeks earlier, basically uh, backporting can start, start earlier and parallel this testing. No, 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 no. I yeah. don't think there is anything like Daniel has suggested, right? Just okay. the baseline selection would be two weeks late, uh, two weeks earlier, and then yeah. everything would continue. Right. Uh, so everything would continue, but basically, if you have uh, bandwidth, etc., you could have started uh, backporting two weeks earlier. So basically, just boils down to your capacity in this phase. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can choose to do that in parallel, but I don't necessarily yeah. have to, and we would not necessarily have a less of a time. Um, okay. I, I actually liked it a bit more than making it a 14-week cycle, because it would mm -hmm. feel irregular making that one a bit special. I mean, mm -hmm. to, to me, this feels a bit, bit easier. Um, there's one point I tried to make. I mean, uh, as, as all of you, you've pointed out, that a lot of people was rushing to put their new features into a release that they believe that would be the LTS baseline before we have the meeting and choose the LTS baseline. And then we sort of have to choose that as an LTS baseline because so many people has featured in that. I, I really believe that, that that's, that's sort of a, the rule of problem. I mean, I'm a big bit on a cynical side here, but you know, it seems like people are expecting or make a set expectations of what an LTS line would be. And then they're trying to put their features in there. So I understand they have a desire to actually, you know, get the features into the as soon LTS as they can, of course. But the thing is that it's actually, you know, very hard to go along with the desire of the stability, right? Because everybody would just expect their fixes into LTS baseline and we cannot really expect it to be all that stable. So I just wanted to point out that these two things are not really working well, well together. And if we just choose an LTS baseline sooner, we would get more time for it to soak and issues to be discovered, of course. But um, again, <clears throat> there's the thing that people will have an idea what it is and we can expect a spike of features into an LTS baseline because we are giving away an expectation of what the LTS baseline would be. So what you're saying is we should implement what's documented here, basically saying two to five weeks old and just choose a safe baseline and once we don't um what once once we en end up ignoring the desire to get super late features in we do that once or twice and suddenly the features will arrive earlier because i mean this is not just a one-way mm. process right there's a feedback cycle here and um the problem was that we're currently in the first, it seems to me like we're in the currently first iteration of this feedback cycle, where previously we went very aggressive because there were no notable features and a few bug fixes in um, the latest weekly when we did earlier decisions. So it looked from the outside that we go with a very aggressive decision. And now we see the, for the first time what the result of that is when there is targeted development towards an upcoming LTS release. Um, now the question is, how does that change uh, the process for choosing the LTS baseline? Because contributors, who work towards LTS will adapt accordingly. Yeah, I mean, you're right, it's probably for the first time that there's so much of a demand on a feature side for choosing an LTS baseline. And the fact is we didn't even have the, our, we didn't even have the first release out, so we really don't have the empirical experience, whether it was good or not, right? Perhaps it's going to blow up in our face and it would be a problem and we would learn from that. But for now, we don't know that. Well, what we can say is that it is an unusually high risk LTS baseline choice. Yeah. Independent of whether 
there will actually be problems or not. And I mean, I'm saying that as one of the contributors who got their major RFE into that weekly, um, I'm, I'm fully aware uh, mm -hmm. of, of the problem. I did not expect um, some of the other changes, but uh, yeah, um, it's, it was just too much, I think, in the end. Mm -hmm. And every contribution sort of was okay, you know, in a way. But it ended up being like three or four major changes uh, yeah. for the entire release into this one wiki. Yeah, but for the record, uh, LCS itself was fine. Uh, we had issues not with LCS, but with the trash it created for .3. Uh, because yeah, everybody was trying to just uh, get all these changes aligned. Uh, and uh, we didn't spend uh, enough time reviewing .3. Yeah, I get that. Uh, so I, I don't really see mm -hmm. that. I mean, do we feel that we have enough data points to to tell that this is a consistent pattern or was a pattern for the last LTS only? Well, uh, I think it's mostly for the last LTS. Uh, we had uh, cases before when we were delivering features. Uh, def uh, definitely not on this scale. So, if we agree to postpone the decision and uh, get more data, I'm fine. But for me, it would be important to see uh, what uh, would be our recommendation with these intervals. Mm -hmm. maybe, just, maybe just removing typically or whatever to have more explicit merge windows. Or maybe invert uh, this structure to provide uh, more insights for uh, contributors. Because here, for example, we could say that, okay, five weeks uh, before um, uh, the decision time, it's basically the end of your merge window. I believe it's what's written there, but it's not explicit and definitely our process didn't follow that. So maybe if you just make it more explicit, it would help uh, contributors because they can uh, do more planning accordingly. Right, but I talked to one or two people mm -hmm. sort of involved in the development here and they were unaware that this documentation even existed. So however they got their information uh, would need to be changed as well. Yeah. So yeah, one way just uh, put additional uh, row here, which basically uh, draws uh, merge windows somehow. So for example, uh, the Y is chosen and we can say that uh, your safe merge window ends here. Uh, then uh, there, are, uh, there is one uh, uh, cell with two weeks where you can probably get into release and then no way or something like that. Yeah, it doesn't help. I mean, right now it doesn't help that we're working in two week increments. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure I want to go more detailed there. Right, because, because another problem is, um, or rather the main problem is that the RC testing period and the development period overlapped. And if we can basically say, um, if, we, if we annotate week 10 with Y release, or likely why release um, could be good enough. The thing is, uh, I'm not sure it makes sense to for us to promote LTS schedule driven development. Um, ideally, features would arrive when they arrive and get picked up in LTS in in, reg in regular intervals. Um, so I'm not sure we should make this much more explicit as project documentation. And I mean, if someone tells us, hey, I have this feature and I want it to be in the next LTS baseline, we can explain what this one sentence on this page of documentation means for them. I'm not sure we want to have, you know, LTS driven development basically be supported beyond that. 
Yeah, I agree that we should probably be more fluent and independent so it doesn't interfere with, with each other that much. But at the same time, what Oleg says, it is it's very hard mm -hmm. for the individual contributors to manage actually matter, matters to me. Um, the thing that makes most sense to me is the suggestion to actually do the decision for the next baseline two weeks earlier. We would immediately get two more weeks of soaking before the dot, dot one is out and uh, people can if they want to voice their uh, was mm -hmm. their preference to actually choose the latest and greatest uh, i mean we can continue in the trend of making this aggressive baseline choices because it would be two weeks uh, later when it when it actually arrives no we could try that yeah or we could uh, just start uh, discussion earlier uh, so if it works for you, Oliver, I'm happy to go with that. Yeah, Daniel. Um, I think that makes sense. Uh, my proposal here, in terms of implementing this, would be that you submit a pull request to Jenkins IO that modifies the LTS documentation accordingly. Basically, write stuff into the table and rewrite the sentence that says two to five weeks um, and link it in a discussion on the dev list and um, let's let's get some more feedback there. Um, I think that's the most pragmatic approach and when we once we have consensus or nobody brings up any major concerns um, that seem uh, relevant, uh, we can we can proceed. Okay. Can you guys please hit me with an action item on this? I would love to do that. My Lenovo display just died on me, so I don't see a thing. Sorry. Mm, no worries. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I was basically about to move into the previous one. So we already seriously over time. Uh, do we want to continue or do we want to, to move anything else to the next meeting or to a sync discussion? Because I believe we discussed the, the most critical items. Yeah, I tend to agree. So a sync or another meeting? Uh, I agreed to drop today. I guess, I, I'm sorry, I don't have it in front of me, so I don't know how many things that that's that, but I guess, you know, reiterating mm -hmm. in two weeks would be okay. Perhaps we would have a feedback from the pull request, so mm -hmm. we can actually, there, there might be more to discuss. Okay, so yeah, just uh, separation point. Okay. And so we noted a bunch of action items today. Uh, let's just deliver on them, and I believe that it could already deliver uh, improvements in the process. So, yeah, thanks Oliver, thanks Daniel, and thanks to everyone who provided feedback in async mode. Uh, so, uh, we can iterate on that and improve. Guys, thank you very much. I really appreciate the, the feedback and the ideas. Mm -hmm. Okay, then. Mm. Thanks all and see you later. Yeah, bye guys. Bye. bye.